You, yes, you, listener. Did you know that everybody at History Hack works for free? And as much fun as that is, it would be great if we could garner just a little bit of support for all of the time and effort that goes in to producing the show. Uh, I have a cat that needs food. Zach has Airfix models to buy. And Boney, well, Boney likes books. So if you can chuck us a couple of quid as a one-off by Kofi or subscribe to Patreon, we would much appreciate it. Thank you. Hello and welcome to an April Fool's edition of History Hack, in which we will tell you a story that sounds so ludicrous that it must be made up, but we swear to God it isn't, don't we, Zach? We do, we do. It's it's like you know, like a bumper instalment of Down the Pub, except that every single thing you're about to hear is legit. And to do it, we've gone and brought on one of our favourite people all-round wonderful human, um, author of Racing Green, author of Super Heavy, uh, a guy who writes for The New Scientist and The Telegraph, a graduate from Sunderland University. We, of course, have the history hack postman, as I described him once on Down the Pub, because he always delivers. Yes, folks, we bring you Dr. Kit Chapman. Kit, great to see you. How are you doing, mate? I'm doing very well. That was one hell of an introduction. Thank you very much. I know, much. no pressure. Well, we kind of sat there and we were like, hmm, 1st of April, so we want something really stupid and funny and hilarious. Go get Kit. Go get Kit and let him, <laughs> let him go on about Crazy whatever he wants to go on about. Kit. So you gave yeah. us a couple of options. Um, which okay. one have we gone for? Uh, so you plumped for the story of a single scientist um, who is my favourite scientist. And as anyone knows from down the pub, uh, that probably means he is a massive pervert. Um, it is the story of <laughs> Jack Parsons. Uh, and again, everything I'm going to tell you in this podcast, regardless of how crazy it sounds, is absolutely true. So John Whiteside Parsons, you bill him as the founder of NASA they really don't like to talk about. Let's start at the exactly. beginning. Who is he and how does he get involved in rockets? All right, so... The, the main thing about John Whiteside Parsons, Jack Parsons, is that isn't actually his name. Um, his first name was Marvel Whiteside Parsons, which is just amazing. He was born in 1914 uh, in Los Angeles, and he's actually named after his dad. Um, and his dad, Marvel Parsons, um, everyone calls him Jack because they want to distinguish it. Um, his dad has a habit for prostitutes, and basically uh, his mum kicks him out of the house. Uh, Jack, and um, he goes off back to, to Massachusetts, where the family was originally from, leaving uh, Jack and his mum alone in Los Angeles. So he's brought up by a single parent. And they move out to Pasadena, and they're not struggling because his mum is old money, you know, American old money. They are super, super rich. He is surrounded by uh, maids and, and, and nannies, all kinds of stuff. And as a kid, he wants for nothing. And the main thing he looks at while he's sort of living alone because he hasn't got any siblings and things like that is he becomes obsessed with the new trend of what we call weird fiction, weird tales. So we're looking at a time now when we've got um, we've got Howard and things like Conan the Barbarian, we've got Edgar Rice Burroughs, we've got you know weird you know, the science fiction starting to emerge. Jules Verne was a previous century, um, but we've got um, H.P. Lovecraft, and so he becomes obsessed with this stuff. He absolutely loves pulp novels and stories about blasting rockets off into space and because he's wealthy he can kind of engage this as a hobby so in 1929 um he and his family um scoot off around his mom his mom mainly but they live with their um with their parents uh, they scoot off around europe and he becomes a little bit more cultured and he gets even more involved in rocketry and he begins correspondence with a chap called Werner von braun uh Werner von braun is uh an ardent nazi and he is basically the father of the Nazi rocket program. And teenage Jack Parsons is having phone calls with this head Nazi rocket scientist talking about blasting rockets off into space. So he gets seriously into it as a kid. He starts making things out of gunpowder, he's blowing things up, fireworks, he makes cherry bombs. He gets thrown out of his very fancy private school because he blew up the toilets. But, and he goes up to Stanford to do chemistry. Now that's what he wants to study. But disaster strikes because as we know the great depression begins in 1929 and old money families really begin to struggle and he can't afford tuition so he has to drop out of university now while all of this is going on 
um, in Pasadena, which is where he's, he's lived and as we mentioned, you've got a group of students from Caltech's Guggenheim Lab, and they are also looking at rockets. They're also into it. And they start calling themselves the Gaussian Rocket Group, but everyone calls them the Suicide Squad because they keep blowing stuff up. And they're led by this guy called Frank Molina, who's an interesting character in to himself. He's a sort of a painter and a rocket engineer, and he's got very bohemian ideas. He's got this ties to communism. And they're told, you can't go and blow stuff up on campus, stop being so irresponsible, go and do your rocket stuff elsewhere. And that group sort of attracts a couple of hangers on, and one of them is none other than Jack. So he gets involved with, with them that way. So if they're called the Suicide Squad, and they're into, hey, let's try and you know blow shit up and, and generally see how we can propel stuff, I'm guessing they're not particularly responsible scientists. What kind of concerns are there about you know, their methods? And give us some of the, the juicy stories of the ways in which they're trying to make this happen. I mean, these guys use all kinds of chemicals that basically you wouldn't see in a lab these days unless they're under heavy protection and, and heavy guard. You've got methyl alcohol, you've got nitrogen dioxide oxidizers. They're, they're trying everything, solid state rocketry. And they're doing all of this while they're smoking pot and they're drinking. I mean, these are bohemians as well. So they are basically, if you imagine, bohemian artists who are really into blowing shit up and firing rockets, that's who you've got here. Um, at one point, they even start working on a Hollywood screenplay, which sort of espouses their feelings about science and peace activism and communism. They're basically students who are experimenting. And so it's an incredibly dangerous environment. And Parsons becomes their armor in chief. Now, remember, he's broke, so he needs a job somewhere else. He's working with an explosives manufacturer at the time, and he's mixing nitroglycerin on his front porch at home. That is not something that is recommended to do by anybody. Um, and this really kind of gives him a, a lifelong uh, involvement in what I can only describe as terrible lab safety. This guy will use sort of, you know, cans of, of whatever that's lying around, empty cans of paint or coffee tins, and he's making up nitroglycerin and dynamite, all kinds of stuff. While he's doing this, uh, 1934, he meets uh, a woman called Helen Northrop at a dance and they fall madly in love and he marries her. So he gets married while all this is happening. Is but, she um, insane? Well, this is, this is it. He, he is an incredibly sort of charismatic, charming guy. I mean, Jack Parsons was pretty handsome. He had this kind of very penetrating dark stare to him. He's got this kind of mystery. He comes from old money, so he has the breeding and the sophistication. Uh, but, but he, he likes also... blowing stuff up a lot. Yeah, but, you know, women like danger. Uh, and, <laughs> and he likes it too. Uh, but it's because of this, this sort of, as I mentioned, this, this sort of uh, almost kind of elitist at at atmosphere. And because he's no longer old, old money, because he's dropped down in social class, he has all the graces, but he's now hanging out with these very sort of relaxed people around him that really kind of lead him astray. Um, and... While he's doing all of this, he kind of gets involved in the occult as well. He starts sort of dabbling in it, which kind of connects to his weird fiction. He's sort of known as this kind of lovable eccentric at this point. Let's talk about, before we go into the occult thing and, and laugh at that, let's talk about um, a more sinister side of it. Tell us about the Kinet Carbon murder trial. <laughs> right. So this is the kind of thing that makes Jack Parsons his name. Um, and he becomes the expert in bombs after this. So the Kinet... Uh, carbon murder trial is just bonkers. Um, the plan, the, the thing is, the idea, there's a guy called Captain Earl Kinnett. Uh, he is the head of police intelligence in Los Angeles. And this is straight out of, you know, one of the pulp novels that Jack was probably reading. He is accused of planting a car bomb to try and murder a private investigator. And this is a guy called Harry Raymond. He's an ex-cop who was actually sort of got rid of from the Los Angeles Police Department for being a whistleblower, he exposed police corruption. And, uh, and Kinnett decides that the best way to get rid of, uh, of Raymond is just to blow up his car and murder him. Um, and Parsons, being an explosive expert, being the guy that knows stuff, actually reconstructs the bomb. And reconstructing the bomb is the key evidence in the trial. He is the star witness for the prosecution saying that Kinnett tried to kill Raymond. And because of that, Parsons basically gains massive fame on the West Coast. 
he, he isn't just this kook anymore who's hanging around with the, the proper scientists. He is the expert. And it cements him with this Galsic group and people start taking an interest in his work and, and what he's doing. Can we get onto the occult now? Although yes. before we do that, <laughs> before we do that, um, I've been having a little look on Google, boss, and I don't know, I think you'd give him a second look. I'm not saying that you necessarily would, but I think you'd give him a second look. I'm Googling uh, now, Jack yeah, Parsons. Yeah. Um, there's a whole kind of quiff thing going on there. Um, you know if you me so him, well. You might also get the sort of the, the weird devil worshipping pictures of him that, that come a bit later as well. There's a picture of him sort of with this spectral ghost, but you'll you'll find kind of like the, the, the windswept hair and a little bit of stubble and he's playing around in a trench coat with his rockets. He yeah. is, but he's got a creepy little moustache that makes him look like a sex offender, which is not doing it for me. I mean, in fairness, he was a sex offender, so uh, <laughs> we'll come on to that in a moment. Right. Shall we Let's deal with the occult, with the occult first? Occult, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and then we'll get onto the sex offences. Yeah, um, so he's always been interested in the occult, as I mentioned, but in 1939, uh, a couple of friends take him, and I, get, I don't know if this was a usual thing to do in Los Angeles when you were bored, but a couple of friends take him to go and see an occult ritual taking place. Um, I, I know, Zach's eyebrows going up. You can't find that in Southampton, can you? You really and, can't. Um, um, you really dodgy can't. place though it can be. You know, <laughs> St Mary's on a Friday night is not the place for the occult rituals, I'm afraid. I should, you should try Thornhill. It's all down there. Anyway, okay. um, there is uh, there's this thing called Thelema. And this has been started and spread by a guy called Alistair Crowley, who is a British eccentric. A lot of people probably have heard of Alistair Crowley. He's sort of the great beast. And he's into devil worship, sex magic. Um, and Parsons goes to one of his sort of Gnostic masses. And he gets super into it. I mean, he's just fascinated by the whole prospect. And I mean, who's not encourage... going to be completely mesmerised by the words sex magic strung together? Well, indeed, indeed. But this is this is sort of Gnosticism to a new level, and there's all the sort of you know, the cloaks and the and the candles. Imagine all the, all the worst parts of a Jonathan Creek episode, and you've probably got the, the idea. And he gets you know so into it that he actually starts recruiting other members of Caltech to join him going along to this. Um, he also brings in Helen's sister, who is Sarah, um, but everyone calls her Betty. Um, and Parsons' interest, we, we don't really know for certain. I mean, he wrote a lot about what he was interested in. It seems to be that he thinks that there is a connection between the science that we know and the occult that we don't, and that he can bring them together. So he thinks that magic is this extension of quantum physics, something that just hasn't been explained yet. But he becomes really fascinated with the occult and that will continue throughout his life. How seriously does he take the black magic? Is it just a bit of fun? Or and you mentioned that he's super, super into it. Yeah, so there is no evidence that he ever considered it just, you know, a lark or something like that. I mean, Alistair Crowley considered him to be a potential successor. He, is, he becomes the main figure in the United States uh, for what we call Agape Lodge and then we've got... Um, O2, uh, OTO, which is sort of the organization of Thelema, um, and he really becomes entwined with this. He also embraces fully its ideas of free love. Uh, he begins banging his friend's fiance, that friend I mentioned he, who he brought in, he begins banging his fiance. Um, he actually gets her pregnant. She needs an abortion, uh, which Jack pays for. His friend finds out they're no longer friends. Um, he also starts sleeping with Sarah or Betty, who at the time is 17, so she's underage. And he needs a place to do all of this black magic lovemaking, essentially. So he rents this house in Pasadena. Uh, it's a big mansion. Uh, he names it the Parsonage. Uh, oh, so no. <laughs> <laughs> one of the worst puns you could do. And he turns it into his black magic love nest. Um, I mean, his room has got a statue of Pan in it. Uh, in the garden at night, you've got pregnant women leaping through flames. You've got swords and daggers on the walls. He's got a chemical lab set up in the garage there. And he is strung out on drugs all the time. I mean, he's been using alcohol and, and pot uh, as soon as he started in Galset. He's taking everything. He's got cocaine, amphetamines, peyote, mescaline, opioids. And this attracts this incredibly eclectic crowd of of sort of people who were in Los Angeles in the late 1930s, early 1940s. It sounds you know, like the friend... 60s. It sounds exactly. like it Madsen does. and his lot. 
Well, it ties in um, with, we'll go into it a bit later on, but basically he ties in with the beat generation. And so he's one of the sort of the forerunners for the beats. And you know, he advertised that I want to talk to bohemians, artists, musicians. He actually puts job adverts out. Um, but he's into witchcraft, voodoo, alchemy, astrology, incantations, poltergeist hunting. He hosts, hosts um, fairy hunts in the garden for kids, um, summoning. And he's hanging out with people like Robert Heinlein goes there, who's the author of books like um, Star Trek Troopers or the Puppet Masters, all kinds of stuff. So he's dragging in the basically the, the bohemian weird crowd of Los Angeles. They're all flocking to Pasadena to hang out with Parsons. He just sounds completely mental. I mean, I'm quite concerned about the fact that he had a chemical lab in his garage at this. That's the fact that people little... let their kids spend time oh. with him. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean. Spoiler alert, spoiler alert, Zach, you're right to be concerned. But we'll okay, come back to that okay. Later. <laughs> we'll get there. Um, so, you mentioned that from, you know, this is happening in, in like the 30s and 1939 to 1945, obviously we get World War II. Nobody's allowed to be idle really during the war. So, you know, a, a guy of science, you get some crazy things invented during this period anyway. Yeah, I mean, is he a guy in demand? What's he up to? Yeah, so you do get some absolutely bonkers stuff in World War II. I mean, um, America were looking at everything from uh, putting bombs on bats and flying them into belfries to kill snipers at one point. That's, I mean, that's for another podcast. They were looking at invading Brazil at one point, even though Brazil wasn't an ally. Is um, this the so, period of the poo bomb as well that Alex talks um, about on World War Weird? <laughs> I was thinking yeah. more of the carrots to make Hitler's grow tits. Yeah, you, you get, I mean, there are so many mad plans. It's just, it just doesn't stop. It, it continues right into, I mean, people are going to drop um, uh, foxes that were painted in fluorescent paint uh, as part of the invasion of Japan, which obviously never happened because of the atomic bombs. But the idea of fox spirits, you know, scaring the locals, they released glow-in-the-dark foxes in Central Park in New York to see what would happen. So you get absolute eccentrics being indulged, essentially. And Parsons is one of them. Because Gelsit isn't just sort of eccentrics, they've actually got stuff that works. They are building rockets that aren't quite as good as, as the Germans, obviously, but you've got Werner von Braun influencing this guy, they know what they're talking about. And so Parsons becomes obsessed with solid fuel rockets. Um, they start doing experimental planes. The big thing for them is what's called jet assisted takeoff or JATO, um, which is basically you strap some rockets to the bottom of the plane, you turn on the rockets, they blast off. It doesn't really work very well. They start looking at uh, different chemicals, different, I um, won't go into all of the chemical details and things like that. At one point, he tries to recreate Greek fire, which is the kind of thing that, <laughs> that you can only imagine Jack Parsons doing in the 20th century. And later on, this, this solid state stuff, although it's very much in its infancy, and although it really doesn't quite go, go off well enough in the United States, I mean, they start being outpaced by bombers. You've got to remember that during the, the Second World War, the most expensive project of the Second World War was the B-29 bomber. I mean, it was about 40 billion US dollars. It dwarfs the Manhattan Project, it dwarfs everything. The B-29 is the most expensive project. And so unsurprisingly, these guys who are only working on a, on a very, very shoestring budget of, I think it's about 3.5 million at its peak, um, are dwarfed by a $40 billion bomber project and they just don't get things to go. But they're still really important. I mean, the FBI are looking after them and things like that. The problem is that Parsons is doing all of this during the day, um, and he's actually starting to extend his his occult practices into the rocket stuff. So this guy's sort of you know tracing dicks on the rocket and writing incantations, and God knows what he's doing with his semen because he believes in sex magic. I'm not even going to think about that. Um, and as I say, oh, the team. Yeah, it's like. So at this point, he's doing inventions by day and sex orgies by night. Yeah, exactly. That is exactly what's happening. What do the authorities make of this? <laughs> I mean, the FBI basically, I mean, the, the police investigate him because they're getting complaints every night. At one point, a 16-year-old boy actually claims that he's raped at the parsonage. There's no evidence that, that actually happened. Um, and the FBI start investigating him as well because obviously they've got one of their, their top scientists, their, their men, who is tied to black magic. It's a bit weird. Um, they're actually probably more worried about his ties to communism, but they do check mm -hmm. him out and things like that. 
and he's constantly tired because he's strung out on drugs. I mean, as I mentioned, this guy is a habitual sort of, he's got his uppers and he's got his downers. He can't do the work during the day. He's, he's lagging behind. And so by 1944, he's an embarrassment. They, they, would, they don't want him in Galtier anymore. And because it's a private company, um, the, the, the group set up from Caltech, they have to buy him out. He's a founding member. And so they give him 11,000 US dollars, um, which is a, is a hell of a lot of money at the time. And he uses it to buy his sex cult mansion, which at the time he was only renting. And God knows how he'd ever get his deposit back if someone found out. But he buys <laughs> yeah, this mansion. Imagine the state of the place. I know. So he buys his sex cult mansion and they part ways. And Galsit soon after changes its name to something that people will be a little bit more familiar with which is the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. So this is the oldest part of what eventually becomes NASA. So sorry, NASA, one of your founders was a sex cultist. And a sex offending sex cultist, just a general nutter um, <laughs> from the sounds of things. Um, I hesitate to say these words, but I want to focus on the sex cult for a moment. <laughs> of course you do Zach I of course I do. <laughs> um, mainly because I want to talk about his wife uh, you've got mm. all of this going on at night so he's got this little kind of inverted commas love shack thing going on with yep. all of his occult stuff um, uh, is she happy about this is she concerned about you know he's going to bring something home to me um, and I don't know quite what um, form it's going to take yeah, she is not happy at all. I mean, she actually gets involved in, in the occult just as much as he does. She is a major finger in the, in the Pasadena branch. Um, and, but Helen is, is like, I don't, I'm, I'm fed up with this. You know, I don't want to hang around with this anymore. And her sister is even more into it. She just gets increasingly drawn in. I mean, to the point that Alistair Crowley starts referring to her and starts believing that, that, uh, that Sarah, the young, Betty, the younger sister, is a vampire. So he calls her a vampire because he's just sort of draining the energy of Parsons and um, and confusing the whole scenario. Um, yeah, his wife his wife can't stand it, and unsurprisingly, they get a divorce. I mean, she she's done. She leaves him and and sort of walks out, and and that's the end of Helen. Um, but we're just beginning with with Betty, aka Sarah. Does she claim the sex mansion in the divorce? In some bizarre <laughs> kind of irony, um, irreconcilable differences of the sex magic. I don't know. I don't know what was mentioned with the divorce, but uh, they, they separate and that's it. Um, and Parsons sort of he, he tries to throw himself a little bit into science to kind of forget about it. One of the things we see with with him throughout his life is that whenever he has a breakup or something like that, he turns to science. He's like, I'm just going to blow some shit up and forget about the woman. Um, so he forms his own little company. It's very, very small. And immediately it becomes under investigation by the FBI because he manages to get hold of uranium. Um, and oh, uranium God. at the time is being used in the Manhattan Project to make nuclear weapons. <laughs> so the FBI are like, no, 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 no. Do we know how um, he gets hold of it? He just buys it. So the thing about uranium at the time, uranium oxide, um, is, is that it wasn't sort of a hard to obtain material. I mean, it's, it's mined. So there's loads and loads of it around there. And obviously people were just sort of, the, the main worry wasn't so much someone had uranium. It was Jack Parsons has uranium. What's he going to do with it? Um, the FBI clear him. I mean, everything that he always gets charged with by the FBI eventually just gets dropped. I mean, nothing sticks to him. He's a bit Teflon in that way. But unable to do the science, he kind of dives more into the sex cult. He starts running it full time. And he turns the parsonage into a swinger pad. He advertises, as I say, for bohemians, artists, musicians, anarchists, all to come with him. And eventually, another science fiction writer uh, turns up on his doorstep, a chap called L. Ron Hubbard. Um, and I'm sure people will know that name. He's the founder of Scientology. And Parsons and Hubbard get on really well. They start hanging out. And Hubbard falls in love with Sarah, Betty. Uh, and Parsons is super jealous about that. Um, but there's this, so there's this weird love triangle going on between Parsons, Parsons' wife's sister, and L. Ron Hubbard. Um, and Parsons, unable to turn to science, starts getting really obsessed with occult rituals. 
and he spends all of his time in his room with his statue of Pan, masturbating and listening to Prokofiev. Prokofiev. Um, and he starts hearing these voices, voices that are telling him to do things, um, which today it turns out were probably... Get a job. Well, <laughs> Sober was, up. It was probably next door, Hubbard and Sarah in the room, pranking him, whispering through the wall. <laughs> but, but it doesn't matter because he becomes so obsessed with this that he decides that he needs a moon child. And the only way to do that is to activate the Babylon working in the, Maho in the Mojave Desert. Um, one of the weird things about Parsons is quite often he kind of, he thinks of himself as an intellectual, but he isn't. I mean, his, his personal Thelema motto was, um, he basically, he took some Latin uh, that, uh, that Crowley wrote down, mistranslated it, and basically came up with a garbage language and sort of went, went to Parsons, look, sorry, went to um, Crowley and went, look, look what I've created. And Crowley's like, Matt, your understanding of the mysteries is so beyond me that I can't even understand the language. And Parsons thinks that this is a, you know, a compliment. Of course, Crowley's taking the piss. He's going, dude, you've mistranslated it. Um, so you, you don't want to know what a moon child is. The concept is that he's trying to summon a scarlet woman um, who will be his de demon worshipping bride so that he can produce a moon child and I, I don't know. I, I don't fully understand the complexities of, of his beliefs. Logistically, then, what are him and L. Ron Hubbard doing in the desert? I mean, so logist we, we don't have full details of, of the ritual. Um, what we do know is that Parsons spent pretty much all of February 1946 masturbating in the desert with L. Ron Hubbard watching and scanning the astral planes, whatever that means. There, um, it, it, it is 24 7 wanking. Um, and eventually he just gets tired of it. Maybe his dick broke, I have no idea. <laughs> yeah. But he, he is knackered, he's in the Mojave Desert. He gets up one day and he goes, Well, I think that'll do me. Um, I think I've summoned my Scarlet Woman. And so he and Hubbard drive back to Los Angeles, and there on the doorstep is a, a Navy vet uh, called Marjorie Cameron. Cameron who has turned up to sort of join the, uh, join the party. It's, it's cheap accommodation. She has red hair. And of course, Parsons believes this is his Scarlet Woman. He has summoned this woman. Now, Marjorie Cameron has no clue about any of this. She is just looking for a place to crash. And suddenly she's turned up and she is told that she is this demon goddess. And of course, Parsons is obsessed with her. He forgets about uh, Sarah all, altogether. Never mind his wife. Marjorie Cameron is the girl for him. Bloody hell. What a thing to be thrown into. Um, how does she react? <laughs> does she just kind of run away screaming? <laughs> I mean, we, we know that she, starts, she gets involved in parties. She starts writing poetry and art. And actually, through, throughout the rest of her life, she dies in 1995, I think. Um, she becomes this artist, um, sort of drawing all these kind of occult symbolism. So she leans into it, basically. I mean, it's that classic bit in Ghostbusters, you know, are you a god? You say yes. You know, she's turned up on the doorstep and she's being told that she's a demon goddess. Of course you're going to hang around. I mean, I would, wouldn't you? Whatever, do I get the biggest bedroom then with the ensuite? suite? <laughs> would be my exactly. response. Exactly. Um, I'm, I'm taking it just because I, I don't hear his name as much as I hear Hubbard and that. Do they stay mates or do they fall out? I mean, is... Oh, right. So this is, this is one of the big scandals of his life. Um, he and L. Ron Hubbard have a massive falling out. Um, and this is one of the things that, you know, you don't hear about, because, mainly because the Church of Scientology really don't want to talk about it, but we kind of have to because it's the story. So Parsons uh, gets approached by Hubbard one day, and Hubbard says he and Sarah, um, Betty, they have this plan. They're going to go to Miami. They're going to buy three yachts, two people buying three yachts, and they're going to sail them through the Panama Canal to the west coast of the United States, where they can sell them for a profit. And they ask Parsons, can we have your life savings so that we can buy the yachts? Now, Parsons at this point is so busy, you know, obsessing over Marjorie Cameron that he doesn't even think it through. He's like, yeah, no problem at all. Here's 20,000 US dollars. He gives them his life savings and Hubbard and Sarah, they peg it to Miami. Who's going to sail the third boat? 
Exactly. The plan doesn't make any sense at all. And in fact, that is never Hubbard's plan. I mean, if you read, read his diaries and things like that, it's, the plan was always, he had this vague plan of going over to China and kind of spying on them. But ultimately, it was about sailing around the world. I mean, Hubbard loved sailing, um, as things like Sea Org and that will testify. So he was probably just buying a yacht so that he could sail around the world. And he had essentially taken the money from Parsons. Now, Parsons is out of, is out of cash. He's in trouble. Um, and so he contacts Alistair Crowley. And you know, he's like, you know, can I spare a bob or two? And Pars um, Crowley, pa Crowley for, for all his faults, for his many sort of failings, he was not an idiot. And he tells him immediately that he is a weak fool. Uh, that's the actual quote. And that he's being defrauded. And so Parsons rushes down to Florida. He heads to Miami to try and stop Hubbard. Now Hubbard has already bought the yacht at this point. He and Sarah are off the coast. Now, Jack's got two options. He knows two things. He knows sex magic, he knows rockets. He doesn't have any rockets with him. He doesn't have time to mix the chemicals. So he does the only thing he can and he gets his cock out. Yeah. And he starts masturbating furiously. In his diary, he writes that he tries to summon a spirit of Mars to sink L. Ron Hubbard. Um, and while, and this is, this is the crazy part, it works, um, the hurricane appears and the hurricane forces Hubbard back to port. Now, Parsons claims all the credit for this. He believes genuinely that he has wanked up a hurricane. Um, of course, <laughs> this is probably just a coincidence given it's hurricane season. Um, but Hubbard and Sarah, they end up in court with Parsons and Parsons gets some, but not all of his money back. And this just deteriorates the relationship, obviously. You know, it's, it's, it's an absolute disaster. But um, he gets a little bit of his money back. Um, and because of the court case, Hubbard and Sarah go their own ways. Now, the story of Hubbard and Sarah is a podcast unto itself. Uh, she probably helps Hubbard write Dianetics. There is an incident uh, later on where they have a child together and the child is kind of kidnapped, I think is the best way to describe it. Um, it gets very, very messy. Um, that child talks Sorry, no, no. It was this is this is this is way way before. So this is all in the in the late nineteen forties. Um, we're talking uh, here, um, but um, yeah. Uh, well, we'll leave Hubbard for another day and concentrate on Jack Parsons. So Hubbard and Sarah are now out of the picture, and obviously his wife has gone his way as well. He's just got Marjorie Cameron with him. Okay, is that his happily ever after? You know, this woman that he believes he's summoned by fapping too much for the space of a month in the in the desert. Is is that, you know, that's, you know, married bliss? It's all going perfectly from then on? No, because this is Jack Parsons. Of course what it's a not surprise. Be perfect. Yeah, so he is with Marjorie Cameron now full time. Um, and he is still trying to do rocket stuff. I mean, he's trying to get back into this because science is always his main passion. He's talking to people about doing rockets to the moon. He's giving a few lectures, uh, lectures. But in the late 1940s, another stumbling block occurs. As I mentioned, uh, he is kind of invested with um, with uh, with communism earlier on. He's, he's sort of linked to that, and many of the people in Galsit were also associated, um, particularly Molina. And so he gets caught up in the Red Scare, and he is basically people think that he might have been a communist spy. So his clearance is revoked. Um, he's not able to do rocket work. And he is a very, very sad panda. Um, throughout his, uh, his life, Parsons was always suffering from depression. I mean, that's probably why he also became very addicted to, um, to drugs and, and started looking for alternative ways such as you know, magic, things like that. He is a very depressive personality. And he, he gets into this flunk. Um, and he starts doing sex um, rituals with prostitutes. Um, you know, very much like his father, only with magic, I guess. Um, and Cameron's not happy about that, she finds out, because all of this comes out in his trial. Um, and we then get another trial, because the only place that he can do rocket work is overseas. And so he's talking to people trying to find, you know, job connections. He's put in touch with someone, and there's a plan for him to move to Israel, uh, which is a newly formed state. It's only just coming into fruition. And he's going to move out to Israel, and he's going to help them with rockets. But just before he moves, he's doing the paperwork and someone rats him out. Someone sends the paperwork over to the FBI and says, have you looked at this guy? And he's put on trial essentially again for being an Israeli spy, uh, of which he's found not guilty. 
And so again, at this trial, all of this occult stuff just comes out into out of the woodwork. So Cameron breaks up with him and uh, eventually they do reconcile, she, they, they sort of come back. But he is, he is, as far as I know, the only person who's been charged of espionage for both Israel and the communists. So at this point, he's lost his job. He's been accused of spying for everybody at the same time, lost his clearance to work on rockets. Um, what does he do? Well, this is the thing. He can't, he can't do his science. He's kind of frustrated. Um, and so he falls in with the occultism again, but less on the black magic. So he and Crowley are basically done at this point. I mean, too much has gone on. Uns unsurprisingly, you know, the Thelma stuff is, is out. And so he falls in with beat poets. And that original generation of beat poets that began flourishing in California in the late 1940s, early 1950s. He writes a book of poetry called Songs for the Witch Woman, dedicated to Cameron. Cameron paints this, as I mentioned, this strange sort of picture of him as a kind of a ghostly demon figure. He's known as the Dark Angel. And, and for a time, I think he's happy. I mean, he's, he's hanging out in his parsonage. He's doing the stuff he loves. He starts dabbling around in, in his chemistry garage again. And in 1952, uh, he's age 37, he gets an offer to move to Mexico and to start up an explosives factory. And again, you know, things are out, out of the way in America, you can't do that. And so he has an option to go overseas and he starts preparing for it. And the day before, uh, you know, Cameron actually goes off to Mexico already. Uh, the day before, Parsons is working in his lab, his garage lab, and we don't know quite what happened, but the entire building blows up. Um, he initially survives the blast. Um, he's missing several limbs and half of his face. Um, he gets to hospital and pretty much dies, dies in hospital. Um, the official version is that he was taking something called fulminate of mercury, which is incredibly dangerous. He had it in a coffee can and he must have knocked it over and that would have exploded. All it would have taken, you know, it fell into the ground and it blown up. Um, there has been some suggestion that because obviously he has depression, it might have been suicide, but as I mentioned, he was moving to Mexico, things were looking up with Cameron, uh, his house was doing okay, it was this place of sort of creativity, which is something that he always wanted, and so I don't sort of buy the suicide thing, it sounds to me like a lab accident. Um, his mother is so distraught by that, she actually commits suicide herself, she kills herself with barbiturates, um, and that's kind of ending the, the Parsons family. Uh, Marjorie Cameron, she takes a slightly different ang approach, and, and I think it's one that, that, uh, that Jack would have appreciated. Um, she begins blood magic rituals to try and summon his, uh, his spirit down to Mexico with her. Um, Completely logical so, response, right? I mean, well, this is, this, is the, this is the world of Jack Parsons. And obviously I, I don't want to spoil people, but it doesn't work. Um, she actually believes it does. Uh, around the time that uh, she's doing these rituals, there is sightings of a UFO over Washington, DC. And Marjorie Cameron takes that as evidence that she has somehow summoned the spirit of Jack Parsons. Um, but that's, that is the end of his life. I mean, 37 years old, um, you know, 1914 to 1952, but he packs a lot in, doesn't he? He wasn't going to go out any other way either. <laughs> I mean, still no. looking at the picture, there's a crazy glint in his eye. I mean, he wasn't going to die of a heart attack in his, his 80s or 90s. No, I mean, this is, this is a guy who, as, as I mentioned, he was a sex practitioner, a sex magician, a rocket engineer, a guy who did chemistry in his, his, his garage, a bomb expert, um, obsessed with, uh, with rockets and trying to get to space and, uh, and, and get to the moon. This is, he does this is, contribute to that. Yeah, and, and, and ultimately, because of his work, because of his work on solid, state, uh, solid uh, fuel propulsion, um, NASA gets to the moon using some of the ideas that Jack pioneered he he is one of the reasons that man goes to the moon and may eventually go to mars things like that so he has his his place in nasa he actually has several things named after him he's got a crater on the moon um obviously it's on the dark side um because <laughs> it was always going to be on the dark side with Parsons, wasn't it um but yeah he is and if you go onto nasa's website you can look up you know the history of, the, of uh, and their founders it mentions jack parsons i think he probably has the shortest biography on the site because they just go and this guy was also here with the rockets doing some rocket stuff thank you move on um <laughs> they really do not like mentioning him but uh, fascinating character and like i say probably my favorite chemist uh, it's now my mission in life to own a house and call it the parsonage <laughs> 
<laughs> I was going to ask if you're going to fill it with kind of like sex occult things, but I'm not sure I want to know the answer to that. <laughs> Kit, can I just ask, a guy like this, you mentioned how he's on the NASA website, so on, but everyone likes to sort of quietly ignore a lot of what he mm. did. Yes, yes, yes. How do you piece a story like this together? You know, is this one of these things that it, it's just known or did you have to go and do some digging to find all of this stuff out? Because this is absolutely mental. It's the sort of thing that you'd try and just keep very quiet if you could. It, it is. So I came across Parsons in a, a book. Um, <laughs> oh, Sorry, don't, don't judge it. <laughs> uh, I, I walked into that one, didn't I? Oh, that wasn't even deliberate. Um, yes, I jizzed across Parsons in a book. Um, no. <laughs> uh, I came across Parsons first off in a, in a book a while ago that was talking about uh, sort of quirky scientists, essentially. Um, and I was just like, this guy sounds amazing. There's a great book about him called Strange Angel. Um, he's actually, there was a, a show on, um, I think it was HBO, where there, a, there was a series about him. Um, and they started making a series of his life and they didn't even get to L. Ron Hubbard. They did two seasons and they didn't even get to Hubbard because there's just too much stuff to pack in. Um, it is it's just so rich and so so um, unbelievable. Uh, I mean, we could only, again, I need to stress, this is April Fool's Day. This is all true. You know, feel free, look it up on Wikipedia, you know, sort of get binded by Strange Angel. This, this is an incredible story that people really just don't like talking about because yeah it's it's a weird sex magician who also helped found nasa on that note kit thank you so much for coming on to entertain us for april fool's day uh, i still think some people are going to go and check this because they don't think it's true uh, you have been phenomenal as ever no problem at all anytime guys and tell us tell us quickly again about racing green Yes, so Racing Green is a book that doesn't involve sex magic or rockets. Um, it is a book about the science of uh, Formula One and other motorsports and how that's spinning out into other areas of our lives. Um, it's all sort of a green focus, so you know, climate change and, and battling that with, with new technologies. It's also got a lot of history of motorsport and motor racing, which is a, a sort of passion of mine. So if you're interested in your, in your history of motorsports or how motorsport sort of relates with the, and interconnects with the modern world, then uh, Racing Green, available in all good bookshops and on um, audio and podcast as well. Um, we've got a, yeah, the, uh, what's it called with the Audible or whatnot? Um, did someone read the book? That thing. <laughs> I've got a good word soon. <laughs> an audio book. There is an audio an audio book. Thank you very much. Yes, Racing Green, available in audio book. And just as a last note for this, I've just Googled Sarah Betty. Northrop and she looks like a librarian not a sex crazed cultist yeah I mean, I mean if you if you if you're looking into the story of of, of Sarah slash Betty um do check out what happens with 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 the kid and L. Ron Hubbard I mean that again is a story unto itself um it's it's a very strange tale but that's something we need to say for another time when our guests join us to talk about their work in their new book the 45 minutes or so they spend with us is just a taster of all their efforts. So to this end, we have launched our very own bookshop on bookshop.org, where you can find our guests' latest and greatest books. You can support them and you can support History Hack too. 10% of every sale via our bookshop supports the podcast and allows us to keep at it and bring you more amazing guests. You can find our bookshop at bookshop.org forward slash shop forward slash history hack or just search on bookshop.org for us under the shops bit. Thank you for your continued support, and here's to your next great book.